people in Jesus' name. We're going to pray together. Would you like to stand up as we pray? Thank you. Father, we thank you at this time. Thank you for your children and for all our invitees, everyone here. Lord, we pray from tonight, you will bless your people. Shower your blessings upon everyone in Jesus' name. Be glorified in the lives of your people. Bless everyone, Lord. Let your blessings be abundant. Fulfill the expectation of everyone. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you. You can sit down. Tonight, we're talking about miracles. I need to define what a miracle is because many people have a limited idea of what a miracle is all about. Before I do that, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. You'll find that word miracle coming there in company of two other words. You have signs, you have wonders. It talks about miracles about signs and about wonders what's a wonder is something that makes you a wonder that amazes you that surprises you that you say what is this i've never seen this in my life before what's a sign a sign is something that god gives supernaturally to announce and to point the way that he is around and god is here tonight and he'll give you the sign and show you. And you'll be able to say, because of this sign, I know God was in that place. And then he'll give you a wonder, something that other people will wonder about. What's a miracle? A miracle is an amazing event wrought by the power of God. An amazing, extraordinary event. We call it an act of God that God does that we receive from the Lord by prayer and by faith. Tonight I'm talking about the greatest miracle in the early church. The greatest miracle in the early church. As you open your Bible, in the Old Testament you'll find miracles. In the New Testament you'll find miracles. Anything God does is great, but then we can still order them in terms of how many people has that event, that act, that miracle, that wonder, that sign, how many people has that benefited? Maybe it's just one person. Maybe it's just one family. Maybe it's a whole community of people. Maybe it's the whole world. And maybe it's for many generations. That's how we classify those miracles. And I'm going to point them out to you so that you'll be able to say, yes, there's a kind I need, that's the kind I need, that's the miracle that I want. The greatest miracle in the early church. As we're talking about the early church, it's going to make us go through some journey into the New Testament, particularly in the Acts of the Apostles. I'm dividing my message to three parts. Number one, the perception of a miracle. You need to see this so that when you see a miracle, you'll be able to perceive, understand that this is a miracle. The perception of a miracle. Number two, the promise of a miracle. You have a promise tonight. The Lord is giving you a promise of a miracle. Number three, the push for miracles. The push for miracles. You push, it comes. And it's going to come to you on you tonight. Number one, the perception of a miracle. I'm coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 14. We're doing this, we're going through this journey now in this point one. Because many people limit the miracles to just one thing. And it limits the solution of problems to one kind of problems. And it says, if I don't have this kind of problem, then there's no miracle for me. Let's see miracles in the New Testament, Acts chapter 1, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with the brethren. Many people read that, they don't see a miracle. 
I see a miracle there because these people that were disunited, disjointed, and divided, all of a sudden something happened. This is an event. They all came together. Jesus was not even in their midst physically. When Jesus was there, they used to argue a lot. I'm greater than you. You are smaller than me. And you are inferior to me. I'm more, I'm more uh, useful than you are. I'm superior to you. Argument all the time. All of a sudden, a miracle happened. That they all united together. The men and the women. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus. Everybody. And they prayed. Isn't that a miracle? Because Peter, James, and John used to sleep a lot whenever Jesus called them to a mountaintop, come pray with me. But they didn't sleep and they prayed and prayed with one accord. When families that have been divided, when they unite together, when husband and wife that have been, they have been separated, and then all of a sudden there's a great mighty thing that happens and they love one another, they can eat together, fellowship together, pray together, take care of the children together, united together, without somebody coming from outside to settle quarrels anymore, I say that is a miracle. I said that's a miracle. When a church, a church that had been divided, and then they argue a lot, the members arguing with the pastor, and the pastor rebuking them, and every Sunday when we come, it's all rebuke and challenge, and every, all of a sudden there's love, and there's unity, and we're calling one another, we're kind of looking for one another's welfare. I say that is a miracle. When children are running away from home, they're all divided. I don't want to go back home today. And then they are reporting their parents to the police. And all of a sudden, something happens in the family. That the father, the mother, the children, they love to see one another. Police people don't come to the house anymore. And that family is united. I say that is a miracle. Wouldn't you believe that? That unity is a miracle. When divided people, disunited people, when they come together in love and unity, that's a miracle, right? The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 4. And they were all with one accord, sorry, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's the early church. These people, they came together. They were saved because Jesus said, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And then these were people that didn't go to college. You understand? Peter, James, John, Matthew, the tax collector, and all these other people. These were just, we call them semi illiterates. They could barely write their names before the Holy Ghost came upon them. All of a sudden, this one is speaking German, that one is speaking French, that one is speaking Portuguese, that other one is speaking African language. And they all spoke, and the other people, when they listened, they understood. I said, That is a miracle. When God has saved you and sanctified you, and then you come before the Lord and you are praying, the Holy Ghost comes upon you and makes you to speak a language you never learned in your life. That is a miracle. And then in verse 41, and they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about how many souls? 3,000 souls. Don't you see a miracle that these were the people that said crucify him, crucify him. We have nothing to do with this Jesus Christ. A miracle happened. God convicted them. They began to confess their sins. They began to ask questions. What shall we do to be saved? And then they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And these 3,000 people publicly identified with the church, with the 120. All these people then continued with the word of God, learning the apostles' doctrine. And you don't have to be running after them. Come to church. Come to church. They just came to church. By the way, they didn't only come on Sunday. They came every day every day. They had all things together and this was a strong mighty church. I say that is a miracle. Isn't that a miracle? When in our church those who came to this meeting now, the Lord touches your heart and transforms your life and then next Sunday, this is uh, just two days uh, to come now, you are here by yourself without anybody calling you and you just say, I must be there in the house of God. The following Sunday you are here, the following Sunday you are there I say there's a miracle in that place. And we're going to experience that miracle. When children are running to church, when the ladies are running to church, when we're cutting down the hours of work, and we say, no, today, Sunday morning, I have a great appointment than the other appointment here. And we're all in church, praising the Lord and worshiping the Lord with the joy of the Lord. 
I said that is a miracle. Isn't that a miracle? You are going to have it. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 3, we're looking at the perception of what a miracle is, perception of being miracle. Acts chapter 3 verse 6, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I not, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Tell me the rest. Rise up and walk. A man that was born lame, paralyzed, and here Peter just came and without any kind of magical scene or medical scene, just said the name, just the name, the name of Jesus. That name is here tonight. Whatever sickness you have, it will be rolled away. Whatever challenges your life, when we mention that name tonight, you are healed in Jesus' name. And he said, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately, everybody say immediately, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. Just like that, supernaturally, immediately, it says his feet and ankle bones receive strength. I've got strength. I said I've got strength. That's a miracle right there. Because this man believed this healing came just like that. Now as I come to chapter 4. In chapter 4, we're looking at verse 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost says unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man here stand before you whole. Who is this man talking? I said, who is this man talking? Look at this man. Just a few days ago, one maid said, hey, you must be one of the followers of Jesus. I said, me? When did you see me there? Please don't talk. I'm not one of them. Another one came, he began to cause the water free. Look at this timid man. And look at this fearful man. A man that was so timid and fearful, he began to swear. He began to cause just a few weeks ago. Now the power of the Lord came upon his life. And before the council, not just before one minute now, before a whole council, they could imprison him. Didn't you know? They could even kill him. Didn't you know? And yet he stood boldly. And then he said, if we be examined as to what has happened to this man, let it be known, not only to you, but to the whole of the nation of Israel. See, Peter, this is a miracle. I said it's a miracle. When somebody was fearful, becomes strong, becomes bold, becomes courageous, and he looks at the enemy eyeball to eyeball, and he says, I belong to Jesus. And whether persecution will come or not, he says, I stand for righteousness. I say that is a miracle. When there's no more fear in your life, when you can carry your Bible anywhere, you can read the Bible anytime, when you can go anywhere and stand faithful and stand firm on what you believe and nobody intimidates you again and you can say, I am a Christian. Not just that I'm a church goer, in fact, I belong to Deeper Life Bible Church. And then you can stand by your conviction anywhere. I say that is a miracle. And if you don't understand what a miracle is, you, you think that only people who are lame receive miracles. You think only people who are blind receive miracles. Or you think that's only when I have headache. I couldn't sleep. You know, for some days now, I've not been able to sleep. I mean, this meeting, I hope I will get a miracle. I don't just hope. I believe you are going to get a miracle. But what if you don't have headache? What if you don't have stomach problems? What if you are married and you have children, you have a job, you have a car, you have everything? Don't you still need a miracle? There are many miracles that are going to take place. That's why I need to explain to you what miracles are so that you'll know it's not just for the sick, it's not just for the blind, it's not just for the lame. Miracles for everybody today. And so look at verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. Whatever makes people to marvel in your life, to, to, to be amazed and to be surprised and to say, how could this man be like this? How could this woman be like, how could this child be bold like this? That is a miracle. And it says, and it took knowledge of them that they had been with 
Jesus. I'm looking at chapter 5. Chapter 5 now, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias was Sapphira. His wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost to keep back part of the price of the land? Stop there for a moment. This is a miracle. This is a miracle. And you know, you have to go for some training and then join the intelligence and the police and then question people and use psychology and use this and that to probe into their lives before you ever get some truth from some people in fact some criminals no matter what you do they won't ever tell you the truth here comes Ananias he sold the land and then he came to the church he was a hypocrite a big liar a deceiver and he was breaking only part of their mouth and he said this is everything and without Peter having to question him saying but how about this how about it no psychology because Peter did not go to college he didn't study philosophy psychology administration all these things that you are studying he just looked at him and said hey Ananias there's something here Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost why why have you done this? That's a miracle. When you have supernatural knowledge, you couldn't have known in any other way, but God just put that knowledge in your heart and you say that thing confidently with, am I sure is this true? See the way Peter spoke? This is a miracle. More than that, in verse 5, and then as hearing these words fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that had these things. That's a miracle. I said it's a miracle. When in the church you cannot tell a lie and just go away like that scot free. When you cannot put something under the carpet. When you just have to be faithful and truthful and honest because you know that the Holy Ghost is in operation. I say in that place that is a miracle. I'm reading chapter 6 verse 7. Acts chapter 6 verse 7 and the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly and a great number of the priests a great number of the priests, these religious people, these were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these were the religious leaders of the land one of them came when Jesus Christ was still on earth called Nicodemus and Jesus explained and explained and explained about being born again, the man did not understand and Jesus said are you not a ruler in the land in Israel and you don't understand these things see how difficult it was for that man to understand and see these people now a great company a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith this is a great miracle when all these religious people they've studied all the theology and, and they were not born again and they just come and they hear the word of God and God touches their hearts removes the scales in their eyes and the darkness of their mind and then they just don't totally